Welcome to the pet oxygen mask training in service for the Boone County Fire Protection District. We receive, we receive these pet oxygen masks from two different sources, one of which is the Missouri Veterinary Medical Association and 10 more of them that came from Dr. Susan Sapansky with the Horton Animal Hospital Forum. Masks can be used for a wide variety of different animals from small like ferrets and cats to larger ones like dogs. The masks will be placed on every frontline engine and the squats. Two of the kits went to the Boone County Sheriff's Department for their canine units. The kit looks like this, has one small, one medium, and one large mask, three oxygen tubings, a leash or emergency muzzle, the instruction cards, a bag to contain it all, the decals I've already used to mark up the box that we purchased to place the kits and protect the plastic of the masks and the rubber seals. They'll be positioned uh, like this uh, with the instruction card over the top. If you want to get more detailed information than what I'm going to provide here today, then uh, please feel free to go to this website and look at the O2 Fur Life Pet Oxygen Mask instructional video. Fairly simple to use. Remove the red cap, attach the oxygen tubing to the mask, and in the other end directly to the oxygen cylinder. Uh, the small mask will run one to three liters, a medium mask will run three to five, and a large mask will run somewhere between five to seven liters. The maximum amount of liters per minute that you will provide to these animals that are suffering from smoke inhalation or from the uh, for respiratory, respiratory arrest will be somewhere between six and seven liters. Choose the appropriate size mask for the size animal that you have. Make sure that you've got it flowing at the appropriate liters per minute. Make sure that the seal, a good rubber seal is around the snout and that you do not block the green exhalation ports that are on the side of the mask as this is how the animal will expel CO2 from the mask itself. If we're using it as blow-by or supplemental oxygen, then simply hold the mask in place. If we have an animal that's in respiratory arrest, we can provide ventilation by simply attaching the appropriate sized bag valve to the mask. Again, the flow rates should not exceed 7 liters per minute. If it's supplemental oxygen, leave the ports open. If we're going to provide ventilation to the animal, then we simply remove the oxygen tubing from the tab on the on the mask and then apply the ambu bag or bag valve to the mask. Now in this case you would place your hands and fingers over the exhalation ports so as not to waste the oxygen but use the appropriately sized pediatric child or adult bag valve and watch for chest rise as your indicator that you've given enough ventilation. Your rate should be somewhere around 23 to 27 breaths per minute. And about af after every one minute of ventilation, you'll check again for a pulse. Remember, human safety comes first. As you can see depicted here, this firefighter was not prepared for this animal's fear. Either they're, they're afraid or he's hurt, but he lashed out at the rescuer. You want to make sure that you properly place the animal your left arm or right arm, depending upon which the orientation of the animal, one around the legs and the lower hip, the other one high up across the chest. If for some reason this dog decides to raise their head up and try to bite, the firefighter can slippery slide his right arm up and secure the head and keep it from being able to, uh, to get to a position where it could bite him. Remember that dogs and cats can both bite through, directly through our structural firefighting gear. Speaking of cats, you can use the scruff of the neck technique. Grab the excess skin that's at the back of the neck and then cradle the animal to you. You can also use the bag that is associated with the, the pet oxygen mask system and place the animal's little body into the uh, bag and then gently secure the bag around the upper shoulders and head not to cre create any kind of tourniquet around the cat's neck, but to protect you and it. When you're dealing with smoke inhalations, the signs and symptoms are very similar 
to what they would be in humans. You may see bright red mucous membranes inside the lips and gums, dry, unproductive cough, raspy breathing, wheezes, increased respiratory rate, increased respiratory effort, irritation of the eyes, discharge from the eyes or nose, collapse, unconsciousness, respiratory distress, respiratory arrest, or cardiac arrest. Remember cats don't pant. If you see a cat panting, they are in serious respiratory distress. If you have an unconscious animal and you need to possibly ventilate them, you're gonna lay the animal down, push yourself behind the animal's back, gently tilt the head back, extend the neck back so you hyperextend and open the airway, open the animal's mouth, and gently pull the tongue out past the canines. Those are those large teeth at the front. While holding the thumb, deep, look into the mouth. If you see an obstruction, you can try to pull it out. If you don't, then gently close the mouth back and provide your bag valve mask ventilations. Again, properly position the patient, put the bag valve mask, put the mask over their snout, and provide ventilations one breath every two seconds. After one minute, check a pulse. There's essentially no time limit on how long you can do this, but really it comes very similar to humans. That's somebody takes over, you're too tired to do any more, or you've done greater than 20 minutes of CPR. It's a very busy slide, but really comes down to this. If you got, you're in cardiac arrest with this cat or this dog, then you're going to provide chest compressions and ventilations at a rate of one to one. Like so much that we do with humans, remember that CPR is a team sport. Somebody's going to be taking care of ventilations. Somebody's going to be taking care of chest compressions. This picture de depicts uh, some of the ways in which we will do chest compressions on the animal. You see a cat, how they've got their hands encircling, and they're basically using their thumbs, very similar to what we would use in, uh, in an infant. Narrow-chested dogs, we would end up placing them on their side, uh, bring our hands down about the lower half of the chest and uh, in the center of that uh, the rib cage area and compress downward. On larger barreled or wider chested dogs, we may actually have to roll them over on their back, similar to what we would for a human. If we're going to try to find a pulse, there's a couple different ways. One, get rid of your Nomex gloves, your, your fire suppression gloves, and then place on your latex gloves. Uh, we can try to find Push your hand on the dog's chest near the elbow joint and feel for the heartbeat. You can also feel for a pulse high on the inner side of the thigh, feeling for the femoral artery. Femoral pulse can be difficult to find in cats. Normal pulse range for dogs are 70 to 180 beats per minute. Puppies can be up around the 220 range. Cats are usually between 120 and 240. Remember, any pet in pain, or if you're going to move them, and cause pain will bite. Use caution, use the least amount of force necessary to restrain them from biting and speak in a calm and reassuring voice. Use a muzzle if, if they're able to maintain their airway, but never use a muzzle if they're vomiting, seizing, or having difficulty breathing. Never leave a muzzled pet unattended and never ever put your fingers in the mouth of a conscious pet. Inside the kit, there is a small leash that can be wrapped around the neck through a, through a ring and then placed around as a, as a leash. It can also be used as an improvised muzzle by simply taking that and then placing it over the dog's snout and then bringing it back up around the head and securing it in a fashion there. Be very careful when muzzling a cat. It's difficult to do that and they don't like things on their face. If you can figure out a way to blindfold them as well as at the same time keeping their, their, uh, their snout open uh, you'll have a better chance of keeping them calm. Signs of heat exhaustion, excessive panting, rapid breathing, gasping for air, difficulty breathing, rapid heart rates, anxiety or anxiousness, red mucous membranes in the tongue and gum, difficulty getting up, struggling to breathe, excessive drooling, frothing at the mouth, weak pulse, dark red gums, dry gums, black tarry stools, dizziness, lack of consciousness, they might seem confused, and an anxious or vacant staring. 
In severe hyperthermia, clinical signs will be collapse, lack of voluntary coordination of muscles, vomiting, diarrhea, hypersalivation, muscle tremors, loss of consciousness, and seizures. The treatment for heat exhaustion or hyperthermia is the same as we would treat for a human. Get them out of the warm environment, place them in a cool shady environment. For the animals, laying them on the ground so that the heat can be conducted from their body to the ground. You can apply a towel and gently pour water over the towel so that the towel retains the water and then apply water frequently so it continues to cool. You can't pour the water directly on the animal, especially on dogs, because they heat regulate by, the, by their panting. And with cats, you want to make sure that they um, never ever place the animal in directly into a cold or ice bath, as that will cause vasoconstriction and, and eliminate their ability to dissipate their heat. Just like with a human, it can also cause them to go into uh, ventricular fibrillation and don't use cold packs on them. It says here in the slide the uh, temperature of normal for cats and dogs is about 101 to 102.5 um, and to check for a rectal temp we don't have that capability in our uh, in our equipment. If we find animals that are in respiratory distress or respiratory arrest notify the, the IC immediately. Remember human lives come first. We've got to adapt some of our, our medical techniques, uh, but we can utilize these masks to be able to help with supplemental oxygen and or ventilation if need be. The IC or should we contact the Animal Control or the Central, Humane, Central Missouri Humane Society. If we find situations in which we think that this is an animal, animal hoarder or that the animals need to be seized for their, their own safety, then we would contact Animal Control. Important numbers to remember. The Boone County Animal Control Office, Poison Control, ASPCA, the University of Missouri Emergency Veterinary Hospital, Horton Animal Hospital Forum, and the Central Missouri Humane Society. Things to remember when utilizing this equipment, scene size up. People come first. Any pet in pain or moved into pain is probably going to bite you. It's a bad idea to chase a pet. They look at us in, the, in our structure of firefighting gear and we are a big scary predator coming after them. Don't corner a frightened animal. Try, don't, don't try to stare down a dog. Calm, cool reactions and avoid direct eye contact with them as that is a threat. Remember that pets are disoriented, scared, and in many cases, they're losing their hearing or vision. An emergency muzzle is a temporary muzzle do not leave a patient unattended with a muzzle. Remove emergency muzzle immediately if the patient stops breathing, having seizures, or starts to vomit. The rescue breathing without the kit happens to go mouth to snout. Preferably, you'll do bag valve mask ventilations utilizing a bag valve, the AMBU, and these pet oxygen masks. When in doubt, ask a question. And when done, the masks are reusable. Simply warm soap and water and allow them to dry. If you have any further questions, please contact headquarters and we can try to address that. If you utilize the equipment and something becomes damaged, contact the duty chief so that we can then place an order for replacement. Otherwise, contact your station commander. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.